Greetings, family. We love you. We thank God for you. And we're greeting you on this beautiful Wednesday. We're rejoicing in all that God is doing to keep us. And he is crowning us with his peace. I am so thrilled that each of us serve the King of Glory, who is not only the King of Glory, but he's the King of Peace. He is our King of Salem. And we magnify God for the peace that passes understanding. I know many of you have been troubled and assailed and very anxious about the seasons of uncertainty that we have entered into. Certainly these times are unlike any that we've ever known before uh, as a nation and as a people, a community. But we have something that most people are seeking and that is the peace of God that passes all understanding. So I encourage you tonight to rejoice in the Lord, to bless the Lord, to magnify the Lord, to be quiet in your spirit, uh, pray with boldness, pray with passion, be exuberant in your prayer, but quiet your spirit and hear the voice of the Lord. That's what's so wonderful about uh, the things that we can learn in this season and we can mine from this uh, storm that we're in the midst of all of the other distractions of the world and the noise, the white noise of the world has been quieted for us. And uh, God is allowing us to get into a still chamber and hear his sweet, sweet voice. And so I would encourage you to do that and, uh, and inflame your passions for his word and read his word, get into his word, depend upon his word, counsel his word and let it heal you. Let it let it be the medicine to the Mara of your bone. And so we just praise God for it. I wanted to talk to you for a few moments before we get into our Bible study about some things that uh, we're obviously going to be uh, sensing, seeing, and living through, experiencing. You know, one of the things that uh, I think is uh, very important for us to understand is we don't need to couch in fear and, and uh, pray necessarily that God deliver us from this thing. I'm, I'm excited about going through this thing. And the reason that I'm excited is because I believe that God is working in it. And if he's called us into it, he's going to carry us through it. And I know that that may sound cliche, but there's a deep spiritual truth to that. Uh, if we're delivered from every dilemma, then we'll never learn the things that God wants to invest in us. And so this is an opportunity. I was telling some of our staff today, this is an opportunity for us to move into places of ministry that we've always talked about, we've always wanted. We've, uh, we've prayed about it, we've sought it, we've thought about it, we've talked to different boards and committees about it. Uh, but for whatever reason, we uh, were slow to move and uh, we, we took our time and perhaps was too deliberate in um, reviewing that. So now, in the last seven days, it's been forced upon us. We're moving into arenas of ministry that uh, we heretofore were not uh, entertaining in this time. So that's a good thing. That's an encouraging thing. God's going to get something out of it. I'm, uh, I just spoke to someone moments ago and said, do you do realize that tonight, Wednesday night, there'll be more preaching on YouTube and Facebook than any other time in our history? And I'm excited about all of the people that are praying and speaking and talking and encouraging one another. We're seeing the church arise and that's what we want to do. We want to encourage you uh, to arise. And so get ready right now before our Bible study. There are three things you can do to be engaged in this season. Though uh, we're, we're practicing uh, disciplines that we're asked to participate in, uh, the, the things that we can do while we're uh, upholding social distancing and being involved and being socially distant, we can be wholly engaged in evangelism. And we can do that by praying, by calling, and by texting. So I just wonder if you could just get on your Facebook feed or your YouTube feed or wherever you are, and you could tell all your friends right now, hey, we're about to go into the sanctuary of the Most High God and study at His feet. And we're going to get a word of encouragement and we're going to hear uh, the anthems of hope ring again in our spirits today after the news that we've heard and seen and been a part of today. We're just going to recluse for a moment in the word and sanctuary in his presence and come forth as the bold people he's called us to be. 
So I would just invite you to pray, to call, to text, to be involved in that. For all of you that are a part of our church family, we want you to know that we're ramping up. We're working night and day. Our team has been incredible. All of the sacrifices that they're making personally uh, to uh, be a part of what God has thrust us into and allowed us to participate in. And so uh, we're ramping up our youth ministries online, our children's ministry uh, environments online. We're going to have something for your children to do while you're studying the word with your friends. And we're, we don't know how long we'll be in this position, but we're going to ramp up and be prepared to uh, invest ourselves in the study of the word with technology. And so we want you to be a part of that. And we're thanking God for all of you who are faithful in your ministry, uh, in your stewardship, and in your benevolence. This is the time. We're a generosity culture, and this is the time that you can practice your generosity. I was thinking today, while the whole world is fearful and hoarding, this is the time for the church to be open-handed and giving it away. And the first thing we can do is give away our prayer. Let's, let's uh, intercede. Let's pray. Let's invest ourselves in uh, the laborious task of praying for a nation that is lost. Let's pray with faith that God is going to do it. And then let's take our devices and call and text people and tell them, get online, be a part of a watch party. You know, I'd love to see us have about 50 or 100 watch parties going on right now and telling the world, listen, I want all of my friends to hear a word of hope because this is the season that the world is reeling, hoping and grasping for a word of salvation. We've got it. We need to share it. And you can do that by being generous with your testimony and telling everyone what the Lord has done. I want to share a testimony with you before we go into the word of God. And that is uh, in this hour of fear, how calm the church is and how great the, uh, the kingdom of God is. Uh, we had one of our elders that was heavily invested in the stock market. And he said the Lord spoke to him about a month ago and prodded him, told him he needed to, to liquidate and get out of the stock market. And he said, Pastor, I sold everything and was taken out of the stock market. And then just a few days later, uh, the decline started, the rumbling started, uh, the noise started and people started getting nervous and I was completely insulated and protected and God protected me. And he said, I am so thankful for being sensitive to the voice of the Lord. You know, that's just what the power of the Holy Spirit is all about. He takes care of us. He is, uh, he's ruling and reigning over our lives and the affections and the affairs of our life. He's taking care of us and he whispers with that still small voice. He'll whisper in our spirit and let us know that we've got peace with him and we're at peace with him because of a covenant that he made for us through his own blood and he saved us. And that means he saved us body, soul, and spirit. And so I just want you to testify and bless the Lord that he's preserving you. He's preserving your employment. He's blessing your job. Uh, he's blessing everything that your hands touch. I believe that right now. God's going to carry us through because remember the message uh, and I haven't started yet, but remember the message. We, we might have been saved in Egypt, but he's going to deliver us out of Egypt. And when he delivers us, he's bringing us out with that prayer and praise and adoration of a people that have been brought out, made whole. And so I want you to know whatever we go through, we're going to go through it with the grace of God. We're going to go through it with kindness and generosity and love. And we know that we are sowing into the kingdom. And this is a kingdom that is not of this world and cannot be shaken by this world. So let's go into the word of God. I want to take you in there uh, into the, to the presence of the Lord and the word of God. And I would just ask you to open your Bibles to Psalms 103. And we're going to pray while you're turning there on your tablet or uh, loading that and, or, or while you're turning in your Bible. If you've got uh, a, a Bible like I do, I want you to just turn to Psalms 103. And let's spend a moment talking about no fear. There is no fear in love. And uh, we're going to ask the Lord to bless us. Lord, in the name of Jesus right now, we've come to confide in you, Lord, all of our anxieties, all of our troubles, all of our disturbances, all of our anxious moments. 
All of the fear that has attempted to assail our minds, we've pushed it back and we've raised up a standard of peace that says we are the children of the living God. And we magnify you for meeting every need right now, Lord. Even while we're praying, there are text and prayer meeting, prayer requests coming in right now, Lord. You see Jim. You see Jim in Central America that needs to get home, that needs to be brought home. And he has a medical condition that only you can deliver and heal, Lord. And I send an angel right now in the name of Jesus Christ to Jim. Send an angel of deliverance and an angel of healing and touch Jim's life right now. Be merciful unto him and his salvation and bring him home, Lord, and reunite him with his family. And we'll give you the praise and the glory forever, Lord. I thank you for healing my father. I thank you, Lord, for healing our elders. I thank you for preserving them and keeping them. And I thank you for opening your word to us for the next few moments in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we bless your name. Amen. Don't you feel good? I know you do. The Bible says in Psalms 103, bless the Lord. Affectionately, gratefully praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. I'm commanding my soul, my mind, will, and emotions. I'm commanding them to bless the Lord with affectionate praise and would laud upon him a praise that is worthy of his name and his name only. And it says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is, the deepest part of me, all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not one of his benefits, not any of his benefits. I cannot forget one thing that he's done for me, one thing he's provided for me in his covenant I shall not forget it. So I command my soul, my mind, will, and emotions to bless the Lord. All of me, bless the Lord. From the deepest part of me, bless the Lord. And then I'm going to bless his holy name and I'm going to bless him so that I forget not one of his benefits. I can never allow my memories to fade in the sweet deliverances that he's provided for me. And then he is the God that heals all of my diseases. Each one of my diseases, he's already healed. He's already met my need. He's already taken care of me because who is he? He is the one who redeems my life from destruction. He's the one that beautifies and dignifies and crowns me with his loving kindness and his tender mercies. He's the God of my salvation. I don't know about you, but I have a testimony of the healing power of God. I'm thankful that he raised me up from a bed of death and affliction. And he said, I'm going to be your God and I'm going to raise you up with the hands of tender mercy. So I cannot forget that God delivered me from destruction. And if he delivered me, then he's going to take care of me now. This is the memory of a worshiper. And so he crowns us with loving kindness and tender mercies. He who is the one who satisfies our mouth with good things so that our youth is renewed like the eagles. Now, notice another verse of scripture that I would love for us to dwell on. And that is something that we've been uh, dwelling on for the last few days. And that is Psalms 91. And I want to take and be careful to rehearse that in your hearing again. And I would like for you to just at your coffee table or wherever you may be, open your Bible, read this aloud with me. I want you to feel the atmosphere where you are with the words of God. Would that be okay? Just join me and read loudly with me because I want the atmosphere of where you are to be filled with this sound of protection and providential care. God, this is the uh, chapter in the Bible that speaks to our covering and our protection. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall remain stable. I'm going to read a different version. Shall remain stable and fixed under the shadows of the Almighty God, whose power can, uh, cannot be wasted. His power cannot be withstood. No foe can stand against him. There's no one who can assail the Almighty God. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, on Him I lean and rely. And in Him I confidently trust, for then He will deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence, the plague. He will deliver me from the deadly plague. He will cover me with His pinions and under His wings I trust and find refuge. 
His truth and his faithfulness are a shield and a buckler to me. Then I am not afraid of the terror by night, nor the error, the evil plots, the slanders of the wicked that fly by day. I'm not afraid of those things because my God is my refuge. He's my shield and my buckler. Mm, I'm about to get happy. Nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction, nor the sudden death that surprises and lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen. It shall turn to that thing on your right and turn to that thing on your left and say, you're not coming near me. Plague, pestilence, trouble. You're not coming near me because I am covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, this may sound a bit strange to you and you may think it just a bit forward to speak with that kind of authority. But if you are a born again believer, you have the right, you've been given the governance and the dominion to speak the word of God. And the Bible says it shall not come near you. There shall be no evil that will befall you. There shall be no plague that will come nigh to your dwelling. I just believe that we ought to go to the front of our homes and to the rear of our homes and around everywhere we are in the bedroom. We ought to speak the word of God and speak it with confidence that God is keeping us and no enemy shall encroach upon us and come nigh our dwelling. So he shall give his angels charge over you to accompany you, to accompany you and defend and preserve you in all of your ways, in your ways of obedience and service. God is going to keep you. God's going to preserve you. I'm reading the word of God. So that means when I'm sowing in the midst of a famine, God's going to give me a harvest. When I'm, when I'm sowing in generosity, when others are hoarding, God's going to provide for me abundance with favor. God's going to make a way for me. I don't know about you, but when you see some of these store shelves, you need to just wonder, I wonder what in the world these folks are depending upon because they're exercising all of their judicious behavior hoarding everything they can touch. They're trying to save themselves. But I've got a God that's going to make a way for me. And I'm going to take what I need and then leave plenty for everybody else because I am a Christian and I don't need to hoard. Because I've got a God who sends his angels who have charge over me to take care of me. So I just want to rehearse that all of your ways. God's going to take care of every area you're obedient in, every area you're practicing a service in, everywhere you're giving a discipline to, God's going to take care of you. Then shall they bear you up on their hands, lest they dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent. You shall trample underfoot because he has set his love. Hear that now. My God, he has set his love upon me. Now, the reason that I can proclaim that is because I know the love of God. He set his love on me. Therefore, will I deliver him? The, I love him. He loves me. You see the relationship? God said, because he loves me and he set his love upon me, I'm going to deliver him. I say God's going to deliver me because I've set my love upon him. There, there is a relationship here that I have with the love of God. I not only receive the love of God, I've given back the love of God. And so that becomes my worship and his glory. And the glory of God rises from the earth because we enter into his presence and we give him worship and praise. And so in that, I have quiet confidence that his word cannot fail me. I have a covenant relationship with his word. And he said, because he set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he knows and understands my name. He has a personal knowledge of my mercy and my love and he knows what my name is to him. He is saved, sanctified, filled with the spirit and he's running to the refuge of my name. Isn't that a wonderful thing? So God said, I can't forsake him. He shall call upon me, the Lord says, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Psalms 91. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful portrait of the love of God at work in covenant for us, with us, and through us. And so I encourage you to uh, dwell on that, be a part of that. And I want to talk to you for a few moments about uh, there is no fear in love. 
uh, on August 14, 1989, Time Magazine ran a story, a sad story of a man who uh, was living in East Detroit and he died of fear. I'm thinking about all of my Michigan family right now and I greet you in Jesus' name, all of you that are here and watching from Michigan. I love every one of you. But there was a contemporary among you in 1989 in East Detroit and uh, this man, Time Magazine said, died and he died uh, a, a terrible death. And I want to tell you about that for just a moment. This man had made several, several expeditions, hunting expeditions over the years. Uh, and he had been bitten by many, many ticks over time. Uh, and then he later learned about Lyme disease. He had been hunting for years, had been bitten for years. But now he learns about Lyme disease, which carries the deer tick. Uh, he became obsessed with fear that he had been bitten some time in his past and he was diseased by some tick from the past that he had never seen. And so he carried this and he uh, started believing this and uh, this conspiratorial work of uh, fear took over his life and he was convinced that he had been bitten some time in the past, though he had no sign of illness. He believed that he had been bitten and he feared that he had passed that on, that disease on to his wife. Doctors tested him. Uh, they even contacted him and uh, he looked at them and, and they searched throughout his life and looked at all of the ways that he could have contracted some disease. And they came up with the reality and, and all of the studies showed that uh, it was not only did he not have Lyme's disease, it was virtually impossible for him to transmit that disease to his wife. But the man did not believe the doctor's report. He refused to believe the doctors that were treating him. And so paranoia set in and he became so paranoid of this disease that he did not know, had no sign of, and had never been contacted by. He became so paranoid that the, the Time Magazine reports that he killed his wife and then he killed himself. It was death by fear. The, the police report tells that they went to the man's home and discovered his body and his wife's body. And they found that his mailbox was jammed with material describing Lyme's disease. And he even had in his mail a slip from a doctor for a doctor's appointment for another Lyme's disease test. What I've come to tell you tonight and remind you of is fear distorts a person's sense of reality. Fear will turn and twist your uh, reality until it consumes you. It consumes your thoughts and your energy. All fear wants to do is control you. Fear comes to control. Fear comes to torment. Fear comes to take all of your energy and reduce it down to uh, a pliable slave and serf of manipulation. Fear comes to punish us. Fear comes to take control of us and manipulate us until we become a slave and a serf to another agenda, a false God agenda, an antichrist agenda. Fear is the enemy of God. How do we know that? Because fear is the enemy of of love and perfect love, God's love, cast out fear. And so each of us are living in a world tonight that is reeling from fear, from the influences of fear. Fear is everywhere you turn. Fear is what you're listening to. Fear is what you're seeing on your radio. You still have a radio? Fear is what you're seeing on TV. Fear is on your computers. Every time you turn around, you're hearing the voices of fear. Fear is so powerful, it has its own universe. It has its own system. It's a system in which worry and anxiety and insecurity and panic all dwell. They all orbit there. Fear is its own universe. Fear is a multi-billion dollar industry. Fear sells more advertising and news subscriptions than any other topic. Fear is the chief architect of an army of digital aggressors and their weapons are apps, news feeds, and notifications. Those things that you look at every time you open your screen, every time you look at your iPhone, look every time you look at your Android, if anyone has one, every time you open your notebook computer, every time you see a screen, your brain is walking into fear's battleground. 
Every time you turn around, fear is reaching to seduce you. Fear is the hands that come with witchcraft. Fear is the very fingers of manipulation. It, it wants to come and intimidate the soul with misery and threat and defeat and danger and panic and worry and anxiety and distress. Does that sound like our times? Everywhere you turn, someone is being stressed out with the news of the coronavirus. Coronavirus. It's everywhere. Everywhere you turn, it's dominated. It's shut down culture. It has absolutely rendered our economy a shamble. And so we see the power and the effect, the voices of fear. And so while the feelings of unbridled emotions and fear is very real, we have to recognize that fear comes to seek to seduce us into an altered reality. Fear never comes to confirm to you the godliness that's at work in you. Fear always comes to seek out your heart, to seduce your mind in your heart and lead you into an altered reality. So God's word meets us right there. In the arena of fear, God's word shows up through our faith. Where we are faithing it, if you will, where we will believe God meets every fear. And it's in God's word that we find the, uh, the sharpness, the tenor, the sound of deliverance coming when our faith meets fear. The book of Hebrews says it like this. He says, since then the children share in flesh and blood. He himself likewise also partook of the same that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might deliver those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all of their lives. Did you hear that? Did you hear that word very carefully? The one who wants to work and he wills to render us as slaves to death is the one that has been met by the love that saved us and sanctifies us. The love that comes to redeem us. This is the God of our salvation. Why? Because he came and redeemed us from the slavish hands and the hold of fear. He came to take control of our lives to free us once and for all. And in him we find freedom and in him we, ha we have deliverance because he is our lover of soul. And so 1 John 4, 18 says, there is no fear in virtue love. Now I want you to hear that for just a moment. There is no fear in virtue love, but mature love cast out fear because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not matured in love. 1 John 4, 18, I didn't say it. God's word says it. There is no fear in virtue love, but mature love cast out fear because fear involves punishment. Anytime you see anywhere in, in any arena on any level of your life, you see fear at work and you, uh, you feel anxious about that and perhaps you feel vulnerable to that feeling and emotion, you can instantly discern and recognize that in this quarter, in this place, in this specific locale, I may be challenged with a trust issue because my maturity needs to overwhelm that with the love of God. And so if I feel vulnerable, that's a place I need to build an altar and have a prayer meeting and say, Lord, let me discern what's going on here so I can pray through this thing and mature over this thing. Because fear always comes measured out of punishment. Anytime you deal with fear, you have to recognize that its origin is from the world of punishment. And so it's very, very important for us to understand this. The Bible says fear involves punishment. So uh, the thing that we need to discern and see and, and recognize is that completed love, perfected love, throws fear outside. That's what the Word says. Perfect love casteth out fear. So perfect love, God's love, cast out fear, throws it outside, right? So it expels it. It, it. it removes it from the borders of our life. It removes its voice, its terror from the shores of our life. Every trace of terror ought to be removed by the love of God from our lives. So when we're assailed by the feelings of fear, because fear is real, when we meet fear, as many have met in the last few days, and when we're roiling with fear and 
anxious about what we're seeing and the uncertainties of time are overwhelming us. We're, there's not something broke with our faith. We just need to recognize right here, I need to have a new moment of conquering this thing that God has given me the victory over. This is a new arena. This is a new opportunity to arrest this voice that is trying to seduce me into an altered reality and triumph again in the love of God over me. God cannot fail. He will not fail me. He's going to lead me out of this thing. He's going to make, me, make a way for me when I seem to have no way before me. He's going to take care of me. I may not have the answer to coronavirus, but I know the one who does. And he's going to protect me in Jesus' name. And so that's the way you mature your love. You, you work on that area and you recognize it. You discern it. You don't, um, you don't discount it. You see it for what it is and you uh, don't, don't take it personal and something's wrong with your faith and you're broken. You just recognize this is a place that I can mature and I can be better at what I'm doing for God if I'll defeat this false information. So the love of God banishes fear. It swallows fear's torment up and uh, it does so by its holiness. God's love is holiness. And so when God's love comes and he confronts that fearful thing, he does so in the spirit of holiness because it's the holiness of God that works the justice of God. And when God's just justice begins to work out of us a salvation, he brings to us a salvation that can only come to us through Jesus Christ. So you, you've got to see this, this pattern at work here. When the love of God comes and he confronts a place of fear in our life, he does so in the austere power of his holiness. He's not coming as some wimpish God that may deliver us or may not. He's coming in the thunder and in the power of his pure holiness. The presence of God comes to arrest that thing that's battling with us and trying to cause us to fall into a couch of fear. He takes that thing by the throat and casts him outside. All of his voices of terror are sequestered and thrown out from the boundaries and the borders of your blessing and your life. And so God comes and does that, but he does that in the power of his holiness. He comes and rescues us in the presence of who he is, the essence of who he is. God is. And so now he comes in all of his holiness and he comes and in his holiness, he works out his justice and his justice always works for us through Jesus Christ, our salvation. And so when we get a hold of this picture and we see that everything comes to us out of Jesus and when it comes to us from Jesus, it's coming as our salvation, but it's coming as the prosecutor of our fear. It's coming to sequester and silence and once and for all imprison that voice that is wanted to torment us. And so this causes us to leap with joy and shout for, for with victory and shout for the praises of God because we have one who is not only our high priest, but he becomes our advocate and he comes with the thunder of his holiness. I just feel the power of God right now where I am. God comes in his holiness to work out his justice. And when he does so, he does so with the blood of the lamb. And that means that Jesus paid it all. It's all in Jesus. There is no other salvation. There is no other place to turn. There is not another one you need to call upon to try and find your rescue. Call on Jesus right now. If you would repent of your sins and lift your hands right in your living room or wherever you may be watching me right now, I, if you, you might be in your car having this on your uh, playing through your um, amplifier. You may be right there in the middle of traffic, but I promise you if you'll start praying and God and repent of your sins, the power of God's grace will come to your life and his love will cast out every fear right where you are in Jesus name. And I'm going to prove it to you for the next few moments. You ready? You ready to run through this? Write this down. If you have your tablets and your pens, you want to write these verses down because these are all verses that have to do with God's word and what he says about fear. Psalms 27 and 30, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalms 56 and 3, when I am afraid, not if I'm afraid, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. So to live with no fear means we choose not to allow fear to wield its unholy influence in our lives and over our lives. 
I'm making a choice to rebel against the voices of fear. I will not entertain them. I will, when the, when the Bible says, when I am afraid, I put my trust in the Lord. So it's a conviction and a choice. I am going to put my trust in the Lord. So I'm choosing not to hear the voice of fear, but I'm choosing to guard my heart for the love of God. I'm going to focus my mind and my spirit upon what is truth and what is true. Isaiah 41 says in the 10th verse, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard. There it goes again. That's that justice. That's that holiness. God's love will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So peace, the Bible says in John 14, peace. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. It is not, it, it is my own peace that I'm giving you. I do not give you as the world does. Do not be worried and upset. Do not be afraid. I give you peace. Second Timothy 1 and 7 says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. I know you've heard that on the internet in the last few days, but I want to rehearse it again for you. We can't get enough of it. We need to medicate our souls and we need to bathe our spirits in this word. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Notice, he, he embarks upon this journey of no fear living with the power of God because the power of God works from the love of God and the love of God ensures the justice of God and the justice of God always advocates for us. I feel the power of his love right now. Oh, I'm about to get happy. Aren't you excited about the love of God? that grips your life right now. He's holding your employment right now. While all the storms are raging in the world, your employment is held in his hand. He's holding your cupboard in his hand. He's holding your food store in his hand. He's holding your health in his hand because he's the God of your love and he's the lover of your soul and he loves you. And so he comes to you with power Love and a sound mind. That's why he's promised to give you the baptism of his own spirit. For this same spirit, if this spirit dwells in you, in your mortal body, that same spirit which dwelt in Christ Jesus, if it dwell in you, you shall be raised. And so we are celebrating that kind of God who loves us. The Bible says in Psalms 94, when anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought joy to my soul. So now, God, you're working this thing out. I don't know how you're going to work it out, but whatever you work out is going to be for my best interest because you're always working your good for me. You remember that. God is always taking that thing that was against you. He'll mine it for good. He'll bring out the good of his store for your benefit and for your blessing. And so when he brings that to you, that's consolation to your soul. Isaiah 43 said, but now that is what the Lord says. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by my name. You are mine. I wonder what would happen in all of our homes tonight across this city and around this region, hundreds of homes. I wonder what would happen if all of us at one time would begin to rejoice in the Lord and begin to praise God and bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and praise Him, recognizing that He has summoned us by His name. He has summoned us not only by His name, He's advocated for us by our name. He summoned us by the name of our life through the name of His resurrection. And so when I get a hold of that, I got to recognize that Jesus has made me a son. He's made you a daughter, daughter. He's made you one of his own and you're called by his name. And so when he summons us, he calls us by our name. He's not calling us in the identity of self and in uh, our dependence upon our help and our trust and our relationship with self saving us. He's calling us by name as an identifier, but he's calling us into the family and through the family that he's created for us to walk and traffic through. And that's our salvation. When you're baptized and when you're glorified by the presence of God, when you're baptized in his name and you carry his family name, there's no weapon formed against you that can prosper. And that's what you have to realize and recognize and celebrate, especially during these times. I'm going to hurry real quickly. Be anxious for nothing. An anxious heart weighs a man down, but a kind word cheers him up. What kind of kindness can we give away these next few days? 
One, wouldn't that be wonderful? This is the kindness of the Lord. Generosity. Tell everybody you know about the goodness of Jesus. Well, the world's coming to an end. No, it's not. Tell them about the goodness of Jesus. And let them see the peace of God that rules and reigns in your life against the backdrop of all of this calamity and terror and, and pain. Let them see how in the world are they so happy? Why are they so full of joy? Let them begin to ask that question and you will be a testimony to them that the glory of God has reigned in your emotions and has reigned over your heart. And you're not anxious about anything because you know that an anxious heart weighs a man down, but a kind word will cheer a man up. Even though Psalms 23 says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. Are you hearing that? You are with me at all times, Lord. And then Joshua said, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Wherever you go, wherever you traffic, tomorrow on your job, whatever needs you have, wherever you may be, whatever you're being called into, whatever calamity you may be faced with, whatever uncertainty you may be steering through, God is with you. Be at peace in that. And then the Bible says in Matthew 6, therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And first Peter said, humble yourselves, therefore, under the God, under the mighty hand of God, so that he will lift you up in his own good time. Leave all of your worries with him because he cares for you. Isaiah 35, tell everyone who is discouraged, be strong and do not be afraid. God is coming to your rescue. I tell you what, I have about 30 more scriptures and I'm not going to take all the time tonight to read every one of them. But I can tell you that God has uh, a scripture. A, a historical purview of our, uh, our lives. And he wants to fill us from alpha to omega, from the alif to the tav of our human experience. He wants us to be filled with peace that passes understanding because of our relationship in him. Not as a result of something that we do for ourselves, but because we're in perfect relationship with him and we're the sons and daughters of God, he wants to demonstrate what he's blessed us with through covenant. And so I would just encourage you tonight, you can go to our app. You can get a hold of the Church of Champions app uh, in your app store. You can download these message notes. They're already there. All you have to do is go under message notes and get them. And you can download them, read them, rehearse those scriptures, read them out loud, carry them in your car, carry them in your backpack, wherever you may be traveling tomorrow. Hopefully you won't have to go anywhere. You need to be doing what everyone has cautioned us to do for the next 15 days. It's going to be difficult. You're going to have to turn all the noise off. You don't have any baseball. You don't have any basketball. You don't have anything to distract you. You can just turn on praise music and worship and glorify God and read these scriptures and begin to preach to the walls and tell the walls how blessed you are and fill that home with the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And watch what happens. You're going to see a reconnection with your children. You're going to see ministry take place. You're going to see happiness rejoin your busyness and all of the things that you've been praying about. God can work it out right now in this season. And I'm believing for those kinds of miracles. I'm believing for uh, a rejuvenated heart. I'm believing for uh, a rekindled passion. I'm looking for uh, testimonies where people have said, you know, I didn't realize I was so busy running to and fro and being involved in all of these things in my life. Life had gotten so busy and so full of white noise that I'd forgotten what it was to be in relationship. And so this is a perfect time to reinstitute and re-inaugurate love and relationship in your home and spend those days, spend that time at the, how many of you are eating at your dinner table and you haven't done that in a while? So this is a wonderful opportunity for us to do ministry. And then I'm going to ask you to do something. Turn your living room into an evangelism center and start inviting your close neighbors, those are the people that you can in the next 15 days. Let's get through this 
uh, this tempest and this very per this period that we're being asked to be isolated. Let's be obedient to that. But after that, I want you to just immediately, when you're walking or talking through the yard, reach over and uh, and give a shout to your neighbor and tell them how much you appreciate them and. Is there anything you can do for them? And let's call our elders and our elderly people. We want people to take them uh, whatever foodstuffs they need. We're here to help them with that. We're going to need people to be ministry hands. And you can start that right now, right where you are, by rejoicing in the God of your salvation, being benevolent with your testimony, using your prayer time, your telephone, and your text, and be an evangelist with technology and say, look what the Lord has done for me. He's given me a piece peace when I really should not have peace. He's given me tranquility when I should be a foreigner to this peace of God. And so I want you to just begin to rehearse that. And then Sunday morning, we're going to gather together uh, digitally. We're going to gather together. We're going to have a great, great worship service. We're going to have a fantastic time. And we don't know what all of that looks like just yet, but I can tell you great things are coming and we're not going to be left behind. We're building up and we're going to do greater things for God. So I just encourage you, be strong in the Lord, family. Be strong in the Lord. I love every one of you. I can't wait to give you a big hug and throw my arms around you. But right now we're not able to do that. And so we're going to live uh, in, in relationship with obedience and we're going to do what we're asked to do for our health and our safety. This is a very serious thing. The, the information that I've read on it, it's, it's quite disturbing. And so I just can't imagine trying to traffic through that and travel and journey, make that journey through that without God. And so I'm so thankful for God. And if you're listening tonight, wherever you are in the world, if you're perhaps tuned into this recording, I want you to know that God is for you. And wherever you may be, if you want to reach out to us, we'll, we'll help you find a great faith family that you can connect with and be a part of. And they will pray for you and love you and bring you into the family of God and encourage you. Don't be isolated after these next few days. Don't stay isolated. You connect with a family that's going to intercede for you and love you and show you the love of God. We love you. God bless you. And we want to see you soon. We're praying for you and we love you in Jesus name.